So we looked in the last video about some of the theory behind control loops. And specifically, we looked at how something like a PID controller, PID loop, can take feedback data coming from a sensor, input that into a controller, compare it to set point information, generate an error, and then adjust the magnitude of the controller output to achieve some process variable change. So it's a bit much to swallow, but we looked at some applications like a cooling coil and how we're trying to tell a valve what position to be in so that we can generate enough chill water flow through that coolant coil to get at the discharge air temperature that we want to get at. We got some things against us like sensor location issues, some of the noise associated with inaccuracy, some of the disturbances in our system, and some of the different feedback lags. But this is the idea. This is how a closed loop control process would work. So now we're going to look at what the control logic blocks look like representing those control loops. So just to start demystifying some of this we have some of the same information we saw in the PID control loop where we have sensor input data, we have a set point that it's being compared to, we have a PID block that is essentially representative of those specific typically P and I settings and then we have some output signal representing the magnitude of the control response that's generated and sent to some piece of equipment. Here we have some enable command because we may not want that PID loop to operate at all times and when we're not operating that PID loop, say when we're unoccupied, we're going to tell the valve command what we want it to be, say closed. So it's very important to begin thinking in this control logic block format for a number of reasons. So first, we have this control logic diagram or CLD set up in a lot of our design drawings. So whether we're in design or we're in something like recommissioning, being able to read and, and think in these terms is going to be helpful. So just to make this seem a little bit less intimidating, we have a lot of the same structure here, even though there's a lot of information packed into it. So the structure is inputs, and you can see from the arrow convention, and where we start at the left of the control loop that are being fed into some process which is some series of other blocks that represent logic or math or some other process and on the right side we have some set of output signals that are even either leaving this control loop and going to a piece of equipment like a coil valve or are going to a different control loop or somewhere else in our control system so not only do they represent HVAC sequences in things like our design drawings and our as-builds, and it's this type of control logic block format that's also going to live inside our controllers. So if we're using a laptop or a workstation to interface with a programmable controller, oftentimes there's plugins or software programs that are going to allow us to build or edit these logic block sheets so that we can manipulate an HVAC sequence of operation. And it's important to note that this format is a lot more robust than narratives. So narratives may be open to interpretation in a way that control logic block diagrams are not. And they also feed for a modern pro programmer the way that they're going to be directly input into the control system. So let's start with some convention. So you can see some of these acronyms here. We want to be able to talk in some common terms about how they're put together. So the Unified Facility Criteria on the Whole Building Design Guide dictates some of the ordering of these acronyms in our control drawings. So the first one is going to be some type of signal source, so something like supply air. The second one is going to be the type of signal it is. So if supply air is part of the airside system, then the variable involved, so whether we're looking at pressure or temperature or humidity, in this case T represents temperature. And then finally, we might have some modifier. So this is optional, but in this case, we add the modifier to indicate that we're not looking at the supplier temperature itself, but the set point that we want that temperature to meet. So there's a number of different signal sources we can use. They typically correspond to different HVAC systems or their components or the modes they may run in. There's a number of different signal types that represent the array of process variables in our HVAC systems. So temperature, pressure, flow, damper valve, position are going to be very common. 
a number of other command types or statuses that we may include. And then the modifiers may indicate where you have a set point, some type of system enable, or a high load limit associated with a certain variable. So here's a couple more examples on the hot water side. And a number of other abbreviations that we may start seeing on some of these control drawings. Okay, so let's break down this actual block and how it's structured. So the first thing we want to note is that the input, we have this shape. And the arrow is going to indicate that we're dealing with an input that's being sent into some type of control loop. So where we have the shading at the rear end of the input, that's indicating that it's coming straight from some hardware device. It's either binary or analog. So if you had something like a temperature sensor being brought into the controller and then representing this control loop input, then you'd have this shading and the A to represent the analog for temperature. So some common inputs there. And then on the output side, you can see that same arrow shape, but here the directionality indicates that it's leaving the control loop. Same convention where on the outside of this block, you're going to see shading where it's going to an actual piece of equipment and whether or not that signal type is binary or analog. So here's some different commands or set points that may be leaving our control loops. And then we have the block itself. So we've been talking a lot about PID loops and PID blocks, and it's important to remember that that's really going to be one of an array of different control block types that we can have. So we can have Boolean logic blocks, which is a lot of the classical logic, the if, then, and, or statements that we can represent in block form. We can have comparators, so looking at two different values and deciding if they fall within some dead band so that you can pass some type of binary yes-no signal out of that loop. We can look at time blocks, so different type of delay or counting or schedule that we may have. We can look at math blocks, so any type of arithmetic or summation or averaging that you may do. And we can look at a number of different general blocks like this set point reset block. So we'll step through some of those starting with this PID block. So here we can say that the PID block is going to output a 0 to 100% command. Let's think about what that means a little bit. So we have to recognize the directionality of that control signal and whether or not we are, as the input rises, if our controller output will also rise or if it will decrease. So where we have a rise in input met by a rise in controller output, we would call that direct action control. And where you have the reverse, we would call that reverse acting control. So why is that important? Well, you may notice on some of our control drawings that we'll see no notation like this that indicates where you have a direct acting control signal and something like a normally open control valve. So as an example, if you have a heating valve and you want it to fail open to prevent some type of freezing condition or occupant discomfort, when you select a normally open valve, you're selecting a valve that has a spring as assembly such that a control output is gonna, going to take that valve position away from that normally open, so it's going to start closing it. So with a heating valve, if you want it to fail normally open, you would select a direct acting control output so that as you start increasing the output, as the temperature starts rising, you're going to be getting away from that normally open position. We're going to see that these Boolean logic blocks are very common. They deal in zeros and ones, and for something like an AND block, we need to have all ones input to this block to be able to pass out a one. And you can imagine how that might be helpful where you have something like start this piece of equipment if I'm being told to, so that's one input, and the second input may be and if I'm not getting alarms. So if, if those are both one conditions, then you can pass a one out and start some other piece of equipment or send out to some other control loop process. An OR block works differently, where any of these inputs can be a one for the block to pass through a one to the rest of the control loop. 
and that could be helpful if you have something like start my air handler if I'm being scheduled to or if the zone says it's super super cold so either of those conditions would be enough to incur a system enable pass through this control loop and then we have a simple not block which is just going to switch the value of that zero or one switches are also part of that boolean logic block family which is essentially an if then statement it has applications where you might see a handoff auto block where you're deciding if you're off in manual or hand or or passing through some control loop variable same thing with status information like occupied or unoccupied but essentially what you're doing is giving this control block some type of criteria if you're in this condition pass this if you're in a different condition pass that Comparator blocks can be important as well, where you have two, say, analog values coming to this comparator block, and if they meet the condition within the dead band prescribed, then you would pass a one through rather than a zero. So there's different flavors this may take on, and they, they all have something to do with being equal or less than or greater than, or some combination of that. Tie blocks can be used in a couple different applications. You may see min minimum on or off time associated with some equipment so it's not cycling. You may have some timer to help with some lead lag or equipment rotation. There might be a start stop delay so that you can say let a pump run a little bit longer when some equipment turns off to get rid of some of the load. Or you could have a schedule running some of this equipment. Math blocks are fairly self-explanatory. I would say out of what's listed here we would see a lot more add subtract and min-max average being used. And then we have a whole slew of miscellaneous blocks. So that could be like this linear reset that's shown here. We can see a, a latch or a toggle that needs a state change to get some output change in the block. A ramp block that would slow down or limit it to some response change. A limit block so that you can keep some variable from exceeding some extreme set point that you have in mind a count up or down block or a hysteresis block which is essentially accounting for some one-way differential as you approach a state change. So here's an example. We talked about duct static pressure in the airside system where oftentimes a designer sets the duct static so how much you need to pressurize the duct based on the worst condition so often your design cooling how much pressure do you need to move the CFM to all of your boxes and keep everybody happy and meet your design loads. So by net definition, we're not going to see those design loads at all time. So what happens when we have a lot of boxes that have their damper closed? Well, we have a system curve that's a little bit steeper and we're creating artificial pressure drop by having that duct static pressure set point so high. So if we could reduce the duct static pressure set point or reset it down from one and a half inch to some smaller number, we'd be able to meet the CFM requirement at reduced pressure and have some fan savings. So that's kind of some of the logic about why we reset some of our set points. And we can do that with duct static pressure. We do that with a lot of hydronic temperature set points on the supply side. We may also do that on the air side with air that's being discharged from a coil. We may also do that on the air side, on the coil discharge set point. That can be done with minimum ventilation, so resetting that off some proxy for how occupied a space would be, either CO2 or some type of motion detector data. Pump pressure, which is very similar to duct static, but on the hydronic side. So these are some of the main block categories that we're going to work with. And what we're going to do in the next couple videos is show how we can use these blocks to start assembling our HVAC sequences of operation in a way that will help us understand how these systems work.